seated and a very good morning to you all whether here or at home it is good to gather together to worship God let us pray Lord God it is a, a, a joy a moment of rejoicing to come and spend time with you and we thank you for this day we thank you for the sunshine of it uh, the sense of life and light that comes with it. We thank you that you have given us this day for our benefit, this Sabbath to rest, yes, but to worship, most importantly, to give you glory, to come together as your people, to gather in your name and declare that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Oh God, thank you that you who are almighty, who flung stars into space and created the heavens and the earth, call us into your presence as your family, as your people. And so we come calling you Father. Lord, all of this is possible because of Jesus Christ, the one who lived, who died, and who rose again for us, that we too may rise with him and inherit eternity with you. Lord, we, as we look to Jesus, we recognize that we have not lived up to his example, not even the, the smallest fragment of it. Lord, if, if people knew our thoughts, they knew our hearts. They knew all the words we said and the things we did and the things we left undone. Lord, if they knew us as you knew us, who of us could stand? Who of us could claim any glory? And yet, out of your love for us, you heap your riches of heaven onto us. What a faithful God, what a merciful God. Lord, as we come then this morning, we ask your forgiveness. 
trusting again in that faithfulness that says whoever comes turns back asks forgiveness will find forgiveness and peace Lord we claim that and ask for your Holy Spirit to instill in us that peace with you and peace with one another that we would know that today is a new start that whatever's gone before is past and whatever is to come is new new in Jesus Christ Lord make this time that we spend here one of that freshness of that brightness and life make it one of joy and rejoicing let your Holy Spirit have free reign among us and encourage us as we praise you. And Lord, in order to shape our hearts, to tune us to one voice, we take up those words that Jesus taught us to pray as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to sing again to God in praise as we take up the words of the psalm as the deer and as we think about God leading us into pleasant pastures and besides still cool waters. Let's stand and sing.
Our reading for today is continuing in James 1, verses 19 and 20. And it's just a couple of verses, so I'm going to read it once, and then we're all going to read it together again. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And all together. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And may God add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. Let's pray together. Lord God, as we open your word this morning, seeking your face, open our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, our minds to understand the good things that you have prepared for us in Jesus Christ. Amen. Once during a company inspection at the, in the army, uh, a sergeant major was walking up and down the ranks, checking that the uniforms were correct and everything was going smoothly until the sergeant major reached a certain soldier and looking him up and down barked, Button that pocket soldier. The soldier rattled by the command stammered, Right now, sir? And the sergeant major shouted, Of course now! And so the soldier carefully reached out and buttoned up the flap on the sergeant major's pocket. The sergeant major, the officer, had been quick to note the uh, young man's problem, but hadn't noticed his own. And that's a a lesson that we all need to learn, uh, because for some reason the faults of others seem to stick out like a missing tooth, while our own faults are hard to spot. James today is going to share three areas which seem to stick out in Christians, especially for young Christians when they face trials. And as we go through today's sermon, we need to keep in mind that what we are applying is applied to ourselves first and to others uh, later, if at all. We need to apply it to ourselves first. James says when it comes to trials, the first thing we need to remember is to be quick to listen. Following on from what we read about last week, James is telling us to be quick to listen uh, and specifically listen to the word of God. It's not listen to everybody that's talking. It's not listen in situations of friendship. It is to be quick to listen to Scripture. And one of the the first things an immature Christian does when they experience a difficulty is to stop reading Scripture. A mature Christian very often will go to the Word of God for help, for encouragement, and for comfort, because they understand that that is the medium in which God speaks. That is where God will, will help them. Someone once said the... Uh, Bible verses are like lanterns. They're made for dark places. They're made for dark hours. It's a bit like the the girl who was going on the train many, many years ago, and she couldn't understand why the train man was walking up and down the cars, lighting lamps. She said, Mum, it's the middle of the day. The sun's shining. Why are they turning turning on those lights? And the mother smiled and said, Well, you just wait a little bit, and you'll see what the lights are for. And a few moments later, the train plunged into a long, dark tunnel, and the wisdom of the lamps became apparent to her. When we read our Bibles, it can seem that a lot of the stuff in there is uh, dull or ordinary or uninteresting or maybe even irrelevant. We maybe can't see why God has gone to the trouble of lighting those lamps of truth. But when we go into those tunnels of bereavement and temptation or suffering, it's there that these verses come to life. Not because they're general wisdom, 
but because they are the words of God to you and to me. We need to be quick to listen to what God tells us in his word. It's only by reading scripture that we know that God cares. The challenge for today is, do you believe that? Do you know that for yourselves? Do you pick up passages like Isaiah 43? When you pass through deep waters, I will be with you. Your troubles will not overwhelm you. When you pass through the fire, you will not be burned. The hard trials that come will not hurt you. Peter tells us this same thing in his letter. He says, and so the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials. God's desire is to help us, to rescue us, to save us. We see that in Jesus Christ, but the rest of Scripture is there for the benefit of our day-to-day living. Not only when young Christians particularly face trials do they stop reading Scripture, but they also stop coming to church. They stop gathering together. It's interesting that a, a more mature Christian can't wait to come to worship. And some of you will have known that feeling over this past period of lockdown. Because we understand that there is help available to us only when we gather together as God's people encouragement and comfort that come from being folks gathered in this way. It's interesting, that's one of my main tasks, uh, as you read in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3. Those who proclaim God's message speak to people and give them help, encouragement, and comfort. And hopefully on a Sunday morning when we gather together like this, you receive something of encouragement, help, and comfort. And if not, you probably need to tell me because I might not be doing a good job. But that is an important factor of what this moment, this time is. And particularly for us in the Church of Scotland, in the Reformed tradition, we hold that Scripture is significant, that it speaks to us in a very particular way, that as we read it, it reads us. Take time to listen to God in Scripture. The second thing that James points out is we need to learn to be slow to speak. found a couple of ancient phrases which might help us. I'd like to share them with you. Uh, probably one of them you'll recognize from school days. I know I certainly do. Uh, men have two ears and but one tongue that they should hear more than they speak. And the other one is, the ears are always open, ever ready to receive instruction, but the tongue is surrounded with a double row of teeth to hedge it in and keep it within proper bounds. As a Christian matures, uh, certain things are learned. One of those abilities is, is when to speak, how to speak. I'm pretty sure we know lots of spiritually mature Christians within our our congregation and the care with which they, they speak. When someone's going through a trial, they don't need to hear a list of verses and explanations. They certainly don't need to hear a sermon. There are times when just a few words are needed. Some people never have a lot to say. But when they do speak, their words are helpful, encouraging, and comforting. Those of you who who look down on on yourself today as people who are simple in speech, perhaps, or not learned, are wonderful. Because God speaks through the small comforts that you give to one another. One of the reasons ministers are not always great at pastoral work is because we are often too quick to speak, and speak a lot. James says a mature Christian is a Christian who is quick to listen and slow to speak. The final thing that James says here is probably one of the more difficult ones. Uh, We all need to become slow to anger. 
There's two words that Scripture uses interchangeably for this. Uh, Wrath and anger, the Greek word for anger, means a lingering, seething emotion, uh, an anger that is, is ready to take revenge at any moment. The Greek word wrath is the idea of blowing off steam. I always think of it as being a bit like, you know, um, the person in the cartoon who who gets frustrated with the child who's done something naughty and the steam comes out of the ears and the top of the skull bursts off and this kind of thing. To blow off steam and to be wanting to take revenge at any moment. It's important to kind of hear a little of their, their explanation like this because I think we can see things like anger and Uh, maybe even wrath as as being kind of minor things in our lives. We can excuse them. The Bible, though, has has a lot to say about both. Um, In the Old Testament, in the Psalms, it says, don't give in to worry or anger. It only leads to trouble. The book of Proverbs says, people with a hot temper do foolish things. Wiser people remain calm. In the book of Ecclesiastes, it says, keep your temper under control. It's foolish to harbor a grudge. In the New Testament, Paul says, never take revenge, my friends, but instead let God's anger do it. And the Ephesians and the Colossians, Paul says, get rid of all bitterness, passion, and anger. No more shouting or insults. No more hateful feelings of any sort. It's a a real problem for people. It's something that needs to be dealt with. It's easy when we're facing trials to get angry, not only at God, but with everyone around about us. Sometimes we hear the justification that, you know, well, Jesus got angry. You saw him in the temple, didn't you? Throwing stuff over and whipping people. I'm just following his example. Or perhaps we might look at the anger of God in the Old Testament. But there's a difference between those two angers. We need to understand that God's anger is always just, always a reaction to evil. Because God is perfect, is divine, is all-knowing, his wrath is never misguided. He is more than capable of appropriately directing anger and wrath. Whereas for us, Well, we're not as good at doing that, are we? Uh, Our anger is often misguided, whether it's through ignorance or misunderstanding. And I'm sure we all have had moments where we've been angry about something and then later later regretted it, realizing that we're in the wrong. Just because God displays it doesn't mean that it's the same for us. And we know that Jesus, who is God, is the same. In John's gospel, Jesus didn't trust themselves to them because he knew them. There was no need for anyone to tell him about them because he himself knew what was in their heart. I suppose one of the difficulties for us when we follow Jesus is that we're following somebody who knows the hearts of the people that he's speaking to, can see clearly into them with divine knowledge. When Jesus is angry, angry, it's perfectly directed, appropriately used. And interestingly, if we are to look at Jesus' life, times when he's angry are about unrighteousness, uh, that which is detestable to God. It's not out of his own self-interest. It's on behalf of, of God that he acts. And when Jesus is personally abused, he doesn't say anything. Uh, Peter points this out. And says, for Christ himself suffered for you and left an example so you could follow in his steps. He committed no sin. No one ever heard a lie from his lips. When he was insulted, he didn't answer back with an insult. When he suffered, he didn't threaten. But he placed his hopes in God, the righteous judge. Jesus said nothing. It wasn't until someone acted against God that he displayed righteous anger. And isn't that also where we fall down? We are supposed to be like Jesus, and and yet it never ceases to amaze me how often we get angry when someone personally offends us, but then we remain silent when sin is exalted and God is dishonored. What I'm saying is that we try to 
We often try to justify our actions by saying it's righteous, when in fact it's self-righteous anger. Now something worth noticing is that James says that Christians should be slow to anger. He doesn't say Christians shouldn't be angry at all. Anger itself isn't the problem. It's the way the emotion causes us to behave that's the issue. If we go back to that passage from Ephesians, we hear, if you become angry, don't let your anger lead you into sin. Don't stay angry all day. I'm sure you know that phrase, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Now, to understand this uh, in its context, uh, we look to the verses a couple of verses later from 24 to 31 where Paul says, get rid of that bitterness and anger. No more shouting or insults, no more hateful feelings of any sort. And what James and, and Paul is trying to say to us is rather than justifying our anger or trying to eradicate our anger, we look at how that anger arises in our hearts and then how we deal with it. James says, slow to anger. And Paul says, if you become angry, don't let it lead you into sin. Again, it's about self-control, keeping it in check. It doesn't allow it to become some sinful way of being or sinful way of doing. Sure, we've all had times in our lives where people have said or done things that have been hurtful to us. And I'm sure that since we've been Christians and whatever Christian community we've been in, we've found that the church and people within the church have also done hurtful things to us. And we've maybe wanted to blow off steam back at them. And the immature Christian will often blow off steam because they don't understand the nature of where it leads to. But the mature Christian knows that while anger is a thing that's going to happen, Dealing with it quickly is important. As I said before, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. And why is it that way? Why do you need to deal with it as fast as that? Well, as Paul goes on, he says, don't give the devil a chance. When our anger is out of control, it's an opportunity for the devil to make use of it and to drive divisions between us and between those we love. There was once a little boy who had a really bad temper. And his father gave him a bag of nails and told him that every time he lost his temper, he was to hammer a nail into the back of the fence. And on the first day, the boy drove 37 nails into the fence. Over the next few weeks, as he learned to control his anger, the number of nails hammered daily gradually dwindled down. And he discovered it was easier to hold his temper than to hammer nails into bits of wood. Finally, the day came when the boy didn't lose his temper at all, and he told his father about it. And his father suggested that he should maybe now pull out one nail for every day that he was able to hold his temper. And the days passed, and the young boy was finally able to tell his dad that he'd managed to take out all of the nails. And the father took him by the hand and led him to the fence and said, you know, you've done really well, my son. This is brilliant. But look at all the holes in the fence. That fence will never be the same. You see, when we do things in anger, they leave holes just like that one. And we know you can put a knife in somebody and pull it out. And it doesn't matter how often you say sorry to that person, that wound is still going to be there. Verbal wound is often as bad as a physical one. And again, a mature Christian knows and understands the damage that anger can do. They know that the devil will have a field day with it. We need to take James' advice to be slow to anger. Because ultimately we need the wrath of God to accomplish the righteousness of God rather than the anger of ourselves. There is a place for anger when it leads to honoring God then that's where it can be used. But how many holes have we left 
in other people's lives through our anger? How many people have we scarred with words and deeds? How many people have scarred us? If we want to grow up to more mature Christians, we need to learn to control it. And the best way to do that is by applying the first two warnings to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Let's pray as we think on this. God, you know how hard this message is to hear. We all struggle with these things. Lord, you know it's a problem for me as much as it is for anybody else. Lord, thank you that you've, you've given us this advice, that you call us into a, a deeper relationship with you, but a, also a deeper way of, of being. Lord, thank you that you have not asked us to do it on our own, but you've given us Jesus, and through him imparted to us that wonderful gift of forgiveness. Lord, that you can do that work of kintsugi with our hearts and with hearts of others, as you mend those broken parts with gold. Lord, we want to do better. Help us then, by the power of your Spirit, to be slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to anger, Lord, help us to turn to your scriptures for understanding. Lord, help us to learn to keep our tongue behind the two ranks of teeth. Lord, help us to follow in your path as you and Jesus Christ laid it before us and taught us to behave. Lord, we are in need. And we thank you that you've promised to provide for our needs. So as we go into the rest of this week, as we take these things up tomorrow and the next day, may you shape our hearts according to your will. And when we have opportunities to practice, help us to do it well. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing again uh, the wonderful words of Psalm 23 as set to music as by Stuart Townend. And uh, I have to confess, on a hot day like this, wearing these clothes, I'm very much looking forward to the cool waters that God will take us to and the pleasant pastures. So let's, let's sing and give thanks to God for his faithfulness to us. my shepherd I'll not want He makes me lie in pastures green He leads me by the still still waters His goodness restores my soul And I will trust
And let us pray now together for ourselves and for our world. As we uh, do this prayer, we're going to take some pauses, and at the end of them, I'll say, Lord, have mercy, and the response is, Christ, have mercy. Lord God, we thank you for your endless mercy to us. We thank you for your love to us. We thank you that even though we are a creation that has gone awry, you do not destroy us to set us right, but you give us time. Time to show your love, your mercy. Oh God, we thank you that In response, you invite us to give of ourselves. And we do that. We do that in our time and our money and our our, our talents. Lord, we ask that you would take these things and you'd bless them. And use them for your kingdom's increase here in Annan, across Scotland, and around your world. Lord, we recognize that it is your will to bring us into your activities. We recognize, Lord, that you give us anger to be used for righteousness' sake. And it is in these moments of of prayer where that anger has its best expression. As we call out to you for change and for justice, for your compassion to be evident, for us, too, to be living out those aspects as you shape us through these prayers. Lord, we grieve with you over the way our world is, over the things that we've seen this week of political wrangling and natural disaster, fighting, loss of life, selfishness and greed. And as we bring to you some of the images and things that we've seen this week, we take a moment's silence as we name them to you. Oh Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, as we we think of our world, we remember our own country and we thank you for it, for all the wonderful blessings that are here. We thank you that it was not by might or by power, but by your Spirit's leading that we have such good education and and welfare, uh, that we have food and, and shelters, that we are affluent. We thank you for these gifts and we continue to praise you for all that you have done for us. 
But Lord, we can too be arrogant, monstrous with what we've been given. And we can treat others with contempt. Lord, as we think of our country, we take a moment's silence to name perhaps our leaders, perhaps people that, that we know in leadership, and we ask for, for mercy, for more of your kingdom. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord God, we pray as this coronavirus continues to plague our world, we pray for uh, healing. We thank you for vaccines. We ask that in places where there isn't enough to treat, where there isn't enough to heal, that you would be merciful. We pray particularly for uh, people who've lost family members and friends to this disease. We ask for your comfort and your compassion. Maybe, Lord, in, in a moment of silence, name people we know, perhaps situations we're aware of, places that are in need of your provision. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Father, we bring before you our church in this time of change. Not just our churches here, but the church nationally and the work of Christians all across Scotland and the United Kingdom. Lord, we recognize that there are many challenges ahead of us, uh, many difficulties that we face, many changes that are coming about. And we ask, Lord, for your wisdom and for your guidance. And Lord, particularly if we have got it wrong, we pray that we would be quick to listen to your word and slow to speak about things that are not our responsibility so that we ourselves would be shaped again. That, that, that comment of Scotland that it was a nation of the book would be clear to us. Maybe we take a moment's silence now and, and name things that are on our hearts to do with faith in our land. Maybe even just to pray for our family's conversion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Oops. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord God, we bring before you uh, the area in which we live. And we remember all those who are struggling financially at the moment, who maybe don't have work or have a work that's deeply unsatisfactory. Lord, we think about folks who are struggling in, in mind and body and heart with, with sickness Lord, we ask again for healing. Lord, we think of people who have recently experienced a bereavement or are living through the anniversary of such. Lord, we think of people who are away on holiday at the moment or who are trying to make the best of the summer. I think particularly of the kids in our area. Lord, we remember those who are afflicted with addiction. Lord, we pray again for the release of the prisoner and the restoration of the broken. Maybe, Lord, as we, we pray these things, we can think of people that we can name, and so we name them to you now in a moment of silence.
Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. And Lord, finally, as we come to ourselves and we thank you that you do call us, we ask you to seek and we'll find, to knock and the door will be opened to us, and that you seek to bless us with the rich storehouse of heaven. For Lord, we ask for ourselves, maybe something in our, our silence just now, something to bless us, something to bless others, something of the righteousness, of God. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. All this we ask out of the great storehouse and bounty that Jesus Christ has won for us in his sacrifice. Amen. We're going to uh, sing again now as we take up those wonderful words of the hymn, How Great Thou Art, and uh, rejoice in God's faithfulness. Let's stand and sing. Thank you. 
benediction from the Franciscans. May God bless you with discomfort. Discomfort at easy answers, half-truths and superficial relationships. Discomfort so that you will live deep in your heart. May God bless you with anger. Anger at injustice, suppression and exploitation of people. Anger so you work for justice, freedom and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, starvation and war. Tears so you'll reach out to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with foolishness. Foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world. Foolishness so that you will do what others claim cannot be done. And may that blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and remain with each of you now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.